This is a story about love. Love that came down from heaven. Love lived with us. Love spoke. Love healed. Love drew crowds. Love changed lives. Love made waves. Love was bold in the face of enemies. Love was true, no matter the cost. And love was faithful. Love prayed, listened, and obeyed. Love knew it had to be done, and did it. Love was betrayed and abandoned. Love was silent when wrongly accused. Love was whipped. Love was beaten. Love was tortured and mocked. But love was strong. Love dragged itself to a cross and laid down willingly to be insulted, shamed, nailed, stabbed, ripped, abandoned, and killed. Love hung from nails as the crowd looked on. And God looked away. Love denied comfort. Love refused rescue. Love courageously did what love had to do. Love sacrificially did what only love could do. Then love took one last breath. And finished. Love gave his life. Love paid our debt. Love saved us all. Even when we were not worth saving. That's real love. That's real love. That's real love. That's real love.
Hebrews 13, 17, it tells us to have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as you must give an account, as they must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be one of no benefit to us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13 tells us, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. And finally, Jeremiah 3.15 tells us, Then I will give you a shepherd after my own heart, who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. And I want to thank the Lord, because I believe we have that here in Bethel. Amen? Amen. Let's give them a
any message, I will videotape him and I'll share it with you. Because this boy knows how to share the love. Amen. We love you guys. Oh, there he is. Amen. Let's give it back here. Amen. Praise God. Well, I just sufficiently embarrassed him. He'll probably need counseling for the rest of his life. Praise God. God has called us to be loving people. Amen? Amen? He's called us to live like Jesus. He's called us to love like Jesus. We saw a video a few minutes ago that, that's, that talked about Jesus, and, and they did not use the name of Jesus one time. They called Him love. The Bible says God is love. And that's a great word, not only to describe who, who He was or what He did, but it is absolutely at the very core of who Jesus was and is today. He's all about love. And love did come. And love did die on a cross. And love did sacrifice so that we could experience the life that we have. And listen to me this morning. You are here today because of the love of God. Let me see your hands if you understand that and know that. And the Bible tells us we're supposed to be loving. Amen? We're supposed to love other people. Now, how many of you know some people are easier to love than others? No point. No please, no point. But how many of you know this is true? And yet God calls us to love like Jesus. And here is what I know about Jesus. He loves everybody. And I believe that that call and that command of God on our lives is real and true. I want to read some words of Paul the Apostle to you this morning that are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I will say before I get started this morning that if you want to be more loving than you are, if you want to be someone who loves people like Jesus loves people, then 1 Corinthians 13, you should read it and reread it and reread it. As a matter of fact, I'll challenge you before we get started, you should go home and memorize it. Some of you have never memorized a passage of Scripture. It would do you and everyone in your world well if you would memorize 1 Corinthians 13. Let me read it too. If I speak with human eloquence, eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor, and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've got nowhere. So no matter what I say, no matter what I believe, or what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head. Love doesn't force itself on others. It isn't always me first. Love doesn't fly off of a handle. It doesn't keep score of the sins of others. Love doesn't revel when others grovel. Love takes pleasure in the flowering of the truth. Love puts up with anything. Trust God always. Always looks for the best. Never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth, and what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our incompletes will be canceled. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like any infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, but it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then, see it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing Him directly as He knows us, but for right now. Until the completeness comes, we have three things to lead us toward that consummation. Number one, trust steadily in God. Number two, hope unswervingly. And number three, love extravagantly. And the best of these is love. Paul the Apostle, who wrote those words, was a man who came face to face with love. He came face to face on the road to Damascus with Jesus Christ. He met love face to face. To face. And from that moment forward, he 
followed Jesus. He, he preached the truth of Jesus. Uh, he lived the life. And those words that Paul wrote are words of a changed heart. Of a man who before he met Jesus did not know understand how to love like Jesus. But after he met Jesus was so transformed by the love of Christ that he became a man who could love like Jesus. I don't think I need to do a lot of church history or remind you that it was this same man. Uh, before he was Paul, his name was Saul. And the Bible says he went about persecuting the church. He went about putting those in shackles who were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, the day that Stephen was stoned to death for his faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says that a young man by the name of Saul was the one who was keeping the, the coats of those who took their coats off to pick up rocks to stone that man to death. This was a man whose heart was filled with hate. This was a man who he knew God, he knew about God, but he didn't understand the love of God. He had never experienced it for himself, and he had never allowed that love to throw, flow through his life. But on that day, on the road to Damascus, he came face to face with Jesus Christ. The love of God permeated his soul, and God changed his life. And he went from Saul the persecutor to Paul the lover, to Paul the man who was against Christ, to Paul the man who was trying to convince everybody to turn their life over to Christ. And I want to say to you today that most of you are in this room today because of the love of Jesus Christ. How many of you have experienced, let me see your hands, if you've experienced the love of Jesus Christ firsthand in your life, that you, you were on your own road to Damascus, come on, raise them up high, and you experienced the love of God through Jesus Christ, and you are not the same person you used to be. Amen. Amen. How many of you get the witness with that? Amen. Amen. And my baby is jumping. How about yours? Amen. I got it. I hear it. I understand it. But what in this world does God want to do with that in my life? Does He just want me to experience love? Well, yes, He wants me to experience love. But He wants me to experience love to such a high degree, His love to such a high degree, that it turns me into someone who becomes a conduit for the love of God. So not only is it me, but He's filling my reservoirs of love so full that every time you bump into me, I'm sloshing love all over you. That every time I come in contact with somebody, that you squeeze me and love oozes out. That's what God wants for all of us. A couple of weeks ago, we took a little survey. How many of you were here when we took this spiritual health assessment? How many of you took this thing? We had people score all over the map. Uh, most people kind of, you know, they kind of scored all over the map. They got some ones and some twos and some fours and some threes and some fives. We had a handful of people who scored all fives, which meant they were just like Jesus. <laughs> And i got to be honest with you, I fought the temptation. I wanted to bring a big trough of water up here and put it on the platform and have those folks come and walk on water just like Jesus did because I wanted to see it. Now, how many of you know that we're becoming like Jesus, but how many of you know most of us and we've got a long ways to go? Look at your neighbor. Get your preacher finger out. Point it at him. Point it at him. Now point it back to yourself and say, i got a long ways to go. Amen. i got a long ways to go. We compiled your scores from a couple of weeks ago, and this is all anonymous. Uh, there are no hidden cameras. Nobody put their names on these things. And uh, we kind of scored you on these areas. And I wanted to read to you how the 11 o'clock service did. Now, not everybody answered every question. Some, some folks didn't fill out any of these. But I wanted to kind of give you some feedback on, on how you answered in the 11 o'clock service when it comes to love. There were eight statements. And, uh, and, and the statements, uh, the, the way to answer them range from one to five. One means never, two means rarely, three means some, four means mostly, and five means always. And the first statement was, I receive God's unconditional love and forgiveness. Now let me push the pause button here for just a second to get a little bit ahead of myself. But how many of you realize that you can't give away something you don't have? I said you can't give away something you don't have. Now, how many of you have $1,000 in your pocket and you're ready to give it away this morning? Can I please see your hands? Amen. I'll be the first one to shake your hand when this is over. Amen. Well, how many of you know you can't give away $1,000 if you don't have $1,000? 
dollars. You you can't give away something you don't have. And so we we told you to kind of uh, to, to kind of score yourself on how well do you receive God's unconditional love and forgiveness. And so here's how you landed. Two of you said never. I never received God's unconditional love and forgiveness. Seven of you said, well, it's a rare thing in my life. Twenty of you said, well, sometimes I do that. Sometimes I receive. Forty-five of you said, well, most of the time. And a whopping ninety of you, almost a hundred of you said, always. I always receive God's unconditional love and forgiveness. Now, how many of you know, if you're in the ninety and, and you're receiving God's love and His, His forgiveness all the time, that's really cool. But how many of you know that God wants to clean out your pipes so it doesn't just get stuck inside of you, but it flows through you? I say, how many of you understand that? Well, that brings us to statement number two. I freely forgive others and love unconditionally. And immediately, the numbers change. Four of you said, I never do that. Twelve of you said, I, I rarely do that. Forty-four of you said, sometimes. Sixty-six of you said, well, most of the time. Only thirty-two of you said, I always forgive and I always love unconditionally. I'd like to meet those thirty-two after service is over because we're going to turn you into teachers on forgiveness. Say that. I'm serious. I mean, how do you know? We've got to learn how to do this. If I'm going to love like Jesus, I've got to learn how to do this. Well, the third statement was I regularly depend on God. Not only to love me, but to love through me. Three of you said never, 11 of you said rarely, 40 of you said sometimes, 57 of you said most of the time, and 47 of you said always. Number four, this is a really good one. I keep no record of the wrongs, and I do not judge. Now, how many of you have ever had somebody do you wrong? Let me see your hands. How many of you just instantly forgot it? I mean, just... How many of you thought about it for a while? Let me see your hands. How many of you wrote it down? Maybe. How many of you had it engraved in stone? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's take a look and see how we did. Number four. Seven of you said, I never, I never keep no record of wrongs. In other words, I always keep record of wrongs. I, I judge people. Um, 26 of you said rarely. 55 of you said sometimes. 54 said most of the time. Only 15 of you, only 15 of us said, I always, always uh, uh, let it go. I always don't, don't make a record of it. I always don't judge people. And, and we keep going. Number five, I treat others with respect and value. Two of you said never. Five of you said uh, rarely. 25 of you said sometimes. 72 of you said most of the time. 56 of you said uh, always. Uh, number six, I use my time to meet the needs of others. Three of you said never. Eighteen of you said well, rarely. Fifty-five said sometimes. Fifty-three said, said uh, most of the time. Twenty-five of you said always. I use my resources to meet the needs of others. What I've got, I give to others. Uh, five of you said I never do that. Twelve of you said I rarely do that. Sixty-two of you said ah, sometimes. Fifty-seven of you said most of the time. And twenty-two of you said always. And then one last one, I always put others, always put others before myself. Two of you said never. I don't ever do that. <laughs> it's all about me. Amen. <laughs> 17, 17 of you said, well, rarely. I don't, I don't usually put people in front of me. It, it's still all about me. 53 of you said, ah, about half and half. Yeah, sometimes I do that. 62 of you said, most of the time, and 24 of you said, I always put other people first. I pray I run into you after church is over. Amen. See, here's the kicker. Here's what I learned. We're all over the map. I mean, we're up and we're down and we're up and we're down. And here's what I've learned from these numbers. There's no one in this room who doesn't have some room for growth in their life. You see, the truth is we may love like Jesus sometimes with some people in some situations. Uh, we may do it uh, uh, on some days better than we do it on others, but can I tell you something? The truth is, every one of us in this room, we've got to learn to love more like Jesus. we got to be more like Jesus. People deserve His love, and they need to see His love through us. Now, I want you to look at your neighbor this morning. I want you to look them up and down. Look at the outfit that they wore this morning. And, and go ahead and be nice to them. Share the love. Where's Jack at when I need him? Share the love. I, I want 
you to, uh, I want you to compliment them, say something nice about them. I mean, if you can't say anything else, that's the bluest blue I've ever seen in my life. Amen. That's blue. Amen. You get me all blue today. Amen. Just come on, tell them something. Compliment what they got on. Amen. Put a smile on their face. Amen. I just want to say to you that I don't dress to impress, and I don't dress for success. I dress for comfort. How many of y'all figured this out already? And so I had two goals in the morning when I'm getting dressed this morning. I was standing in my closet and I was trying to find clothes to wear. And I looked at my wife and said, I can't find anything to wear. I have clothes in my closet. It's not that I don't have clothes in my closet. I just couldn't. Nothing. I touched it. It wasn't comfortable. How many of y'all are talking about? I'm like, hey, no. I, I, I'm holding on to something going, can I preach in this? I don't want to preach in this. Amen. I touched a suit jacket and I, I went into just a spell. I mean, it said, I saw a box of ties and I said, in the name of Jesus, get me behind me. <laughs> I dress for comfort. I dress for comfort. And if I'm comfortable, and I put this outfit on this morning, I was really comfortable. And then I turned around and, and I said, I said, Christine, what do you think? <laughs> and she said, you look good. Okay, that's it. Oh my God, I'm comfortable. And my wife likes it. And so that's it. Why am I talking about this? Well, I want to say, I don't care what you've got on this morning. we got a suit and tie on or t-shirts and shorts on. I don't care. But what I do care is, did you, listen to me, did you put on the garment of love? Paul wrote these words in Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. He said, and regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It is your basic, all-purpose garment. And I love what he says next. Never be without it. Listen to me, folks. We cannot afford to leave the house without putting love in our lives. It is something that the Bible commands us. It's supposed to be a part of my life. And guess whose responsibility it is for love to be in my life? It's not just God's responsibility. Listen to me. It is my responsibility. Unless we think that it's some outer garment that we put on from the outside, I want to remind you that love comes from deep down inside of you, not to the outside. How many of you have ever experienced fake love? Let me see your hands right there. Have you ever? Come on now, folks, you've experienced this. You've experienced this in church. If you want to experience fake love, you can go to churches and experience this. You know, people come over and go, love you, love you. Love you. Love you. They don't mean it. They're not sincere. It is not just in church. How I many of you have ever experienced this stuff at home? Come on now. Yeah. Amen. I remember when I was a kid growing up, me and my brother used to get into fights. He always started them. I always finished them. How I many of you understand that? It was, we'd always get in fights and we'd get in fights and we'd beat each other up. I remember one night we got in a fight and we fought so hard that both of us were covered in bruises, these little knuckle bruises. We didn't hit each other hard enough to like cause a black eye, but we were covered in these. We looked like we had been under a steamroller or something. It was so stupid. And my mom caught us fighting. And we always, when we would fight, we would try to not let mom catch us. Because one of two things would happen. Either we would be a, a, a trip to the switch tree. How many of you know what that is? That's where you go out and you peel all of the leaves off of a branch and you introduce your children to the switch. Amen. That this was before they called it child abuse. How many of you don't understand what Amen. Saying? And so we would either have to make a trip to the switch tree or even worse than that. Mom would say, okay, I'm going to bring you over here and just stand and you're going to kiss and make up. Uh, like, I'm not kissing him. He's a worm. What are you talking about? And my mom would say, give him a hug and give him a kiss on the cheek. Or we're going to the switch tree. How many of you know as I'm hugging him, I'm trying my best to squeeze him absolutely into it. <laughs> are, are you following me? That is so fake. I, I wasn't expressing love to him. I was expressing, I just can do it what I had to do because I had to do it because I didn't want to go to the switch tree. I want to say to you that sometimes the stuff that exudes out of us that we somehow try to mask and call love is not love at all. We're just doing our duty. We're just going through the motions. Listen to me, church. It is high time that the church be the church of Jesus Christ and we are called to love like Jesus. You see, we get confused. We think love is a feeling. How many of you have ever felt like you were in love? Come on now, folks. How many of you ever felt? How many of you ever fell in love? Okay, how many of you? Guys, right now, I'm, I'm trying to help you. Right now, it would be a good time to squeeze your wife's hand. Put your arm around her and say, oh, I still feel it. Go ahead. Amen. I remember the first night I met Christy. I was pretty
preaching. I was preaching my heart out. I was in faith assembly of God in Salem, Virginia. And Pastor Hurley Short had called me to preach a revival there, a youth revival. And man, my heart was, I wanted to win these kids to Jesus. I wanted to see them filled with the Spirit. I wanted to see them called into the ministry. And I'm preaching my guts out. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm like in the middle of a point or something. And I said something like, Jesus loves you. And I looked back to my left, far left corner of the church. There sat this girl. I did not know what her name was, but she was absolutely the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. She is sitting on the edge of her seat. She is taking notes. She's nodding her head. And I did a double take. Come in here and I'm going, and Jesus loves you. I mean, I had, I had goosebumps. How many of you have ever had those goosebumps? How many of you have ever got queasy? I, all of a sudden, my, my knees went weak. I was like, ooh. <laughs> she still does that to me. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm trying to make a point. We, we think love is a feeling. we got to somehow work up a feeling. I've had people sometimes, I can't love him. I don't feel it. I'm just not feeling it. Well, I just want to share something with you. The Bible doesn't say you're supposed to feel it. The Bible says you're supposed to do it. You see, you can't command a feeling, but you can command an action, a choice. And the Bible says loving people is a choice. So the Bible commands us to wear love, to put on love. Regardless of what else we put on, Paul says put on love and never be without it. The Bible says that love is a matter of conduct. It's something we do. It's an action, not a feeling. It's an action, not a word. The Apostle John expressed it this way in 1 John 3, 18. He said, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. How many of you know that love is more than words? In the English language, we just, we just, we got it wrong when it came to this whole idea of love. Because we use the same four-letter word for all kinds of things. Now, how many of you love your wife? Let me see your hands, guys, if you love your wife. How many of you ladies love your husband? How many of you at least thinking about it? Hey, Amen, okay. <laughs> now, how many of you have a sports team that you love? Let me see your hands, guys. How many of you have, you, you, you just love your job? Let me see your hands if you just love your job. How many of you, you know, like three people. How many of you like, love your car? Let me see if you love your, how many of you love your kids? It, yeah, okay, yes. How many of you love pizza? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. So I love Christy, and I love pizza, and I love the Dallas Cowboys. There you go. <laughs> what is wrong with this? Well, we, we kind of, we just don't get it right. Now, in the original tongue, the original language of the New Testament, in the Greek language, there are actually four words for love. There is the Greek word storage, which means natural affection. There is the Greek word eros, which means sexual attraction. There is the Greek word philia, which means emotional affection or friendship. And then there is the Greek word agape, which means unconditional, giving, sacrificial love. Listen to me. When the Bible speaks of the kind of love that God has for us and the kind of love that we're to have back to God and the kind of love that we're to have for other people, the word is always agape. It is a commitment to act. It is an unconditional commitment to, to move towards someone and with action and with commitment to love. Now, where can we learn to love like this? Well, there is no better model than Jesus himself. You see, Jesus understood how to love people. And Jesus understood that we needed to get this. In John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus was teaching one day, and here's what he said. He said, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. You see, we didn't come up with this, love like Jesus. This isn't our idea. This is God's idea. This is straight from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. He said, I'm giving you a new commandment. You are to love just like I have loved you. You and I are to love like Jesus. Jesus says, the way I've modeled this for you, the way that I have loved you, I want you to pass that on to other people. He said, I'm the model, and this is the way that I love you, and this is the way that I want you to love other people. In that 
that same chapter, John chapter 13, uh, backing up to verse 15, Jesus said this, I have given you an example to follow. Watch this. Do as I have done. Can I say to you that Jesus is not asking us to do anything that he hasn't already done to us and for us? Now what I know to be the fact is that you and I cannot fully understand how to love other people until first you understand how much God loves you. You can never offer to other people what you don't possess yourself. Listen to me. You can't be gracious to other people if you've never experienced the grace of God. You can't be merciful to other people unless you have tasted of the mercy of God. And you can't be loving to others unless you understand how much God loves you and you have experienced experienced His love firsthand. When you get that, when you feel that, when you understand the incredible, audacious, indescribable love that God has for you, and you feel that love at work in your life, listen to me, then and only then are you going to be more loving towards other people. It's going to be a whole lot easier for you. It's going to be a whole lot easier for me to love other people when we have received God's love for us. So today, we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to look at how God has loved us. And then we're going to turn around and we're going to see how He wants us to love other people. And my goal today, one of the things that I want for, for you today is that you would experience the love of God in your life. Listen, if you don't get anything else in this service, I want you to be overwhelmed. I want your whole being to be flooded with the fact that God loves you. Amen. Let's look at how God loves us. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is, is another passage that Paul the Apostle wrote to the church at Ephesus. It's found in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Here's what, here's what he said. I love this. It, it was a prayer. He said, this is my prayer for you. I pray that you will be able to feel and understand how long, how wide, how deep, how high His love really is and to experience this love for yourselves. Paul says, I want you to know how wide God's love is. I want you to know how long God's love is. I want you to know how deep God's love is. I want you to know how high God's love is. And he says, I don't want you just to have a head knowledge of this. No, no, no. I want you to experience this love for yourselves. Listen to me, church. The love of God is deeper than any ocean. The love of God is higher than Mount Everest. The love of God is wider than this nation. It, it, his loving arms wrap all the way around this world. The love of God is so big, so huge, and God wants you to know that love. Amen. Amen. Now, how do I know this? Well, how do you know that God is love? The Bible says in 1 John 4, 16, when the Bible describes Him here, it simply says God is love. He, 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 is, he is love. He's not just, he doesn't just have love. He is love. God cannot help but pour out His love in our lives because that's who He is. And I love the way He does it. How many of you know God takes care of us? Come on, wave at me if you know God is taking care of you. We had a man, we had a man at our service last night who before church started, he told me, he said, I had a surgical procedure on Thursday. He said the doctors were going in. They were doing a, a, a probe inside of me because there was this this thing inside of me that they needed to check on, they needed to probably remove. He said they tattooed me, they marked me so they could go in, and he said they probed for over an hour. He said this is the top surgeon in Palm Beach County, and he said when it was over, he came into my room and apologized because he couldn't find anything, and he said not only is whatever it was gone, he said we've done another MRI, it's just not there. He said I couldn't even find the tattoo that I put on you when I started, it looked like somebody else had been working on you. Hello, Jesus, How many of you had breakfast this morning? Let me see your hands if you ate breakfast at home before you got here. Let me see your hands. How many of you stopped somewhere in around here at a health food store like McDonald's? And, and, yeah, okay. How many of you ate when you got to church? Let me see your hands. How many of you ate at home and then when you got to church you ate again? Absolutely. Oh, yes. Where did that come from? Some of you would say, well, oh, a Publix. 
So some of you would say McDonald's, and some of you would say, well, I know y'all get y'all stuff from Dunkin' Donuts. So I just want to say, it's not from Dunkin' or McDonald's or Publix. It is from the very hand of Almighty God. There are people in this world who did not have anything to eat this morning. They won't have anything to eat for lunch or dinner, but God provided for you. It's His love that He's poured it out in your life. How many of you are still breathing? Let me see your hands. Some of you are worried because you haven't moved since we started. I'm convinced there's some people that come to church, they've trained themselves to keep their eyes open while they sleep. I, I, I just know that. If you're still breathing, God gave you the air to breathe, and He gave you the lungs to suck it in with, and He gave you your body to process it. Listen to me now, friend. Your heart is beating because of the love of God. Amen. He's provided for all of your needs. One of my favorite passages. I've used it in funerals. I've used it in weddings. I've used it in the hospital. I've used it in the pulpit. I don't think there's any way I haven't used it. It's the 23rd Psalm. I love the 23rd Psalm. And, and you can hardly get past verse 1 and you start understanding how good our God is. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Hallelujah. He's my shepherd. He's my Jehovah Roy. He is the God who shepherds me. Jesus echoed those words in John 10, 11 when He said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd is willing to die for his sheep. How many of you know we got a shepherd? I appreciate Ariel and what he said about our pastors this morning. And we are, we are shepherds. But how many of you know we're under shepherds? Come on. We just work for the shepherd. How many of you know the great shepherd? His name is Jesus. Amen. And he is, listen, when Pastor Mike can't be there, when Pastor Craig can't be there, when Pastor Anthony and Pastor John can't be there, listen to me. Jesus is there 24-7. He's my shepherd. And I have no wants. Because John 10, 14 says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Matthew chapter 10 verse 30 says, God even knows how many hairs are on your head. Hallelujah. He knows you. He loves you. He cares for you. Psalm 145 verse 17 says, The Lord is loving towards all He has made. I love 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 7. Here's what it says. He is always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. Hallelujah. That's our God. That's the one who's loving us. Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 27 says, God is your refuge. And underneath His wings or underneath, you are underneath His everlasting arms. I love Romans chapter 8 verse 39. This is one of those that I got tattooed on my brain. And nothing shall separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's no depth. There's no height. There's no demon powers. There's no, there's no pain. There's no nothing that can separate me from the love of God in my life. Now, if I want to love like Jesus, I've got to experience that love. I'm going to very quickly take you to a conversation that Jesus Christ had about this whole idea of love. And I want to try to change your way of thinking and help you understand that, that this is really about an expression of God's love to you, an expression of God's love through you, so that you hear and feel and understand and live under the shadow of His loving arms, but at the same time, you let that love flow through your life. Jesus is walking through the crowds one day, and, and the crowds are pressing on Him, and a teacher of the law casually strolls up to Jesus. And he asks a very serious question. He looks at Jesus and he says, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? I mean, the very top commandment of all of the commandments in the Old Testament. Now, you know, most of us preachers, some of you ask me questions sometimes, and I say to you, I'll get back to you on that. You know, Here's my email address. Let me go look it up. Let me study it out. I'll send you some stuff. But Jesus did not do that. Jesus didn't say, wait till I get back to my study. Or Jesus didn't say, come hear me preach next week in the synagogue, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Absolutely not. He did not waste a second. The guy said, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, I'll tell you what it is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And Jesus said, this is the first and the greatest commandment. How many of you know that Jesus put value? If you were to look at the values of Jesus Christ, 
you would understand that he valued more than anything else relationships. He valued his relationship with God that was top of the heap. And he valued his relationship with people. And he said to this young man, and he says to us today, your very first priority in life is to receive the love of God, and watch this, and to love God back. With all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. How I many of you know that's what God calls us to? But Jesus didn't stop there. He kind of gave the guy some bonus material. He said, you ask about the first commandment, and it is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. But let me tell you what the second one is, Jesus said. The second one is, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, there are no commands more important than these. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? He's saying the most important thing in your life is love. The most important thing in your life is to love God. The most important thing in your life, secondly, is to love other people. You see, we've got to value God and a relationship with God, and we've got to value people and a relationship with people above everything else. And some of us in this room, we're starting to get that, but how many of you know a lot of times we value everything else? But we value our job. We value our career. Uh, we value our popularity. Uh, we value politics. We value the money in our wallet. We, we value our job, our car, our cell phone, our stuff. And God says those things are not what has to be important in your life. Listen to me, church. Uh, God's raising the standard on us. If we're going to be like Jesus, then we got to think like Jesus. Then we got to live like Jesus. And we got to love like Jesus. And Jesus says, this is how you do it. You love God, and then you love other people. How many of you know if I receive the love of God into my heart, and I start experiencing how high, how wide, how deep, how long the love of God is in my life, and then I start loving God back with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, with all of my strength, if I start loving God with all of my heart, what is my heart? It's my emotions. It's when I open my heart to God and say, God, this is how I'm feeling. Lord, this is what I'm feeling right now. And I open my heart to God. And I start loving God with all of my mind. Now, I let God in my head. How many of you know we need to start thinking about God? Come on, folks. Some of y'all are thinking about lunch right now. How many of you know we need to be thinking about God? We, we need to have focused thought about God. Where the, the intelligence is. Where the learning takes place. We need to shut everything else down. And we need to think about the things of God. I need to love God. With my heart, with my emotions, with my mind, with my thought life. I need to love God with my soul. Your soul is where all of the decisions of your life are made. It's where your will lives. Come on, folks. How many of you have ever thought in your head you should do one thing, but you felt in your gut you should do something else? How many of you have ever been on that, that ride? And there's this tug of war, and there's this war going on, and at some point you've got to decide, head or gut, what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling. And you know where you made that decision? That decision was made in your soul. It is where your will is. It is where you decide right from wrong. And when I'm loving God with all of my soul, I am deciding to go His way. I'm not basing my decision on my opinion. I'm basing my decision on what does God say about this. And that's loving God with all my soul. I love Him with all my heart. I love Him with all my mind. I love Him with all my soul. And I love Him with all my strength. What does that look like? That means I start acting out of this love. In other words, when I see somebody who's hurting, I start loving them because God loved me. In other words, now it's got my feet. This love is not just in my head. It's not just in my heart. It's not just in my soul, but now it's in my feet. It's in my hands. It's in my mouth. And I'm starting to act. I'm starting to really commit that I'm going to let this love flow through my lives. And then when that happens, number two is a natural progression. In other words, love God, and then, Jesus says, you'll be able to love people. Now, how are we supposed to love people like Jesus? How many of you know that God meets the needs in our life? How many of you have had the needs met in your life? We talked about breakfast a minute ago. We talked about the air we're breathing. I mean, He meets the physical needs in our life. Whether that's food or water or shelter or clothing or support or help, He's always meeting the needs in our life. I found it quite humorous. I think God has a sense of humor. And I think God just works things together. He must have thought I needed a good sermon illustration. I got a text message from one of my board members yesterday, and he said, Pastor, I just came to the church to let Mae Jones in. She was bringing some bread to feed the homeless people. 
And she, he said, but pastor, we have a problem. She didn't bring enough bread to just feed the homeless. She must have brought 500 loaves of bread. He said, I'm serious. She brought all this bread. And I texted him back and said, did she bring fish too? Amen. I just... <laughs> May, how you doing back there? I told him this morning, I said, we're challenging you to live like Jesus, but you're starting to do miracles. What is it? And so this morning, waiting for you out there, some of you have already picked yours up and you've got it hid under the seat front of you. But there's bread out there. And listen to me, there's enough bread out there for you to have one and for you to take one home for your neighbor. Amen? Amen. Now this isn't the Saturday night service where everybody's quiet. This isn't the 9 o'clock service where I might kill somebody if I do this. This is the 11 o'clock service. Y'all are alive. Here, catch. Amen. There you go. Oh, that felt good. Amen. Who wants to catch one up here? You ready? Or me? You want for a long one, brother. Here you go, guys. Oh. Y'all didn't know I played football, did you? No. I didn't know I did either. I, 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 that was God. See, I almost hit you. It was real close. I'm trying to make a point here. We got to learn how to share. Listen to me. This is what He does for us. What in the world are we doing for people around us? The Bible says that we, just as Jesus meets our physical needs, we are to help meet others' needs. Psalm 34, verses 9 and 10 says, Fear the Lord, you His godly people. For those who fear Him will have all they need. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry. But those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Jesus demonstrated this for us. Jesus one day he's teaching and, and the crowd gathered and they had no food. And so Jesus turns to Philip and he said, hey, hey Philip, where can we get some bread? How much bread would it take to fill this, feed this crowd? And Philip freaks out. It was just a test. And Philip failed the test. Because the Bible says Jesus already knew what he was going to do. And they found a little boy who had a few barley loaves and some fish. And Jesus said, that's all we need. And Jesus started tearing the fish in two. And he started tearing the bread in two. And I just, I would have loved to have been there. How many of you are hoping that it's videotaped? I, I want to see that. Because every time he would tear a head off, the head would grow a tail and the tail would grow a head. And now instead of one fish, he's got two. And the more he tore, the more he had. And the more he ripped the bread, the more he had. And he fed 5,000 men, all of the women, all of the children. And the Bible says, you can read it for yourself, it's in John chapter 6, that when he was done, there were 12 baskets full left over. Everybody is swole up. Everybody is full. And there's enough left over. That is the kind of love that Jesus has. He meets practical physical needs and he tells us to do the same. In Proverbs 19 verse 17, he says, if you help the poor, you're lending to the Lord and he will repay you. In Hebrews 13, 16, he says, don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices, he said, that pleases God. And I love 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. It says, my dear children, let us not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. Well, God meets our physical needs, of course, and that's how He wants us to love like Him, firstly. Secondly, He meets our emotional needs. Come on now, folks, how many of you have ever had God or reached out and meet an emotional need in your life? Something like inclusion or acceptance, love or appreciation. How about affirmation or showing you interest? Quality time, comfort and care, encouragement, respect, personal value, uh, a safe place, support, authenticity, listening and understanding. And I could go on and on. Let's talk about how God, first of all, does that in our life. And let's talk about how He wants us to do that in, in other people's lives. You see, I believe that God shows up and He encourages us. How many of you have ever been encouraged by the Lord? Come on, folks, have you ever been comforted by the Lord? How many of you ever felt like God was listening and if nobody else understood, God understood where you were at? See, He wants us to do that. He wants us to do that for other people. Let's talk about the, the emotional need of acceptance. How many of you know we all want to be accepted? Come on now, folks, how many of you know everybody wants to be accepted? We all want to be accepted. We all want somebody to come and say, hey, bro, how are you doing? It's good to see you. Man. I got a smile out of it. You know why I got a smile out of it? Because I accepted Him. 
I'm, I'm, I'm showing him love. I'm accepting him. How many of you know that we, if we're going to love like Jesus, listen to me, church, we've got to learn how to accept absolutely everybody that God sends down the path into our life. You've got to accept everybody. Hello? How many of you know we don't accept everybody? Because oh. here's what we do. We believe that acceptance and approval are the same apple. In other words, if I accept you, somehow I'm approving of you. That's not true. You see, if I choose to accept you, I may not approve of your lifestyle. I may not approve of your language. I may not approve of your choices in life. But guess what? I still am obligated to accept you because God accepts you. He accepts me. How many of you have felt the acceptance of God? See, uh, we, we get on our spiritual high horse after we give our life to Jesus. And we look down our long, righteous nose at people. And we go, I'm not going to accept you because you're a prostitute. You're a heathen. You're a homosexual. I'm not going to accept you because I'm a holy one. And you're an unholy one. Well, I just want to remind you. I mean, maybe you need somebody to remind you. That sir, ma'am, there was a time in your life when you were an unholy one. You may never have been a prostitute or a homosexual or a drunkard. You may never have been somebody that, that you don't accept. But can I tell you something? You were somebody that somebody else wouldn't accept. And God Almighty looked down at you and He said, Sir, I'll take you just like you are. Ma'am, I'll take you just like you are. You see, God accepts us just like we are. He loves us too much to leave us like we are. But He starts by accepting accepting us right where we are. What's that little song that George Beverly Shea has sung for years in Billy Graham Crusades? Just as I am. What does that mean? Well, God takes me just like I am. How many of you know that God took you when you were a mess? Some of you still are a mess, but that's another sermon. How many of you understand? We were a mess. So that means when God sends somebody in my life that I don't approve of their lifestyle, I don't have to approve of their lifestyle to accept them. I can show them love. I can show them unconditional love. It is my requirement to do that because God did it for me. God does it for them. And if I'm going to love like Jesus, then I've got to learn how to accept people. Let's talk about one more in this arena. How about listening and understanding? How many of you know God wants to teach us how to listen to people? Listen, some of us have the gift of gab, and God wants to deliver us from it. Anybody besides me in the room ever wondered why He gave us one mouth and two ears? You ever thought about that? I believe we should listen twice as much as we talk. Now, how many of you know somebody who talks enough to have two mouths? I know some people talking enough to have five. And in the middle of the conversation, sometimes I just want to hold up these papers and say, do you have ears? I see them, but are they working? How many of you know one of the greatest gifts you can give anybody is just to listen? I said the greatest gift you can give anybody is just to listen. Last night I got a phone call. I got a, I got a message on Facebook and I got a phone call. The message on Facebook was from a young man who said I've blown it. I messed up my marriage. I'm viewing pornography. It's destroyed. My marriage. I need help. I listened to what he had to say before I responded. Before I said anything, I listened. Ten minutes later I got a phone call. From a deputy's wife. He said, My husband has committed adultery against me again. And our marriage has fallen apart. And I don't know what to do. And last night I spent two hours with that deputy listening, letting him pour his heart out before I spoke into his life, before I told him what I thought he needed to do, before I spoke into him. Are you listening to me? Are you understanding what I'm saying? You see, God wants us to learn how to open these. Sometimes we need to open these and shut this and turn this on so we can listen and understand. But I'll tell you what it does. It shows people the love of Jesus Christ and it melts their heart and they start seeing, I need, not only do I need you to understand me, but I'm starting to believe that God might understand. And they'll open their hearts to the Lord. Last thing. God meets our needs physically and we're to meet others' needs physically. That's how we love like Jesus. We love like Jesus the same way that He loves us, by meeting emotional needs. And then we love like Jesus when we meet spiritual needs. And what are we talking about there? Well, I'm talking about compassion. I'm talking about mercy. I'm talking about forgiveness. I'm talking about accountability. 
I'm talking about ministry and I'm talking about prayer. You've been forgiven by God. Wait a minute if you've been forgiven by God. Wait a minute if you've really been forgiven by God. Wait a minute if it's like overwhelming how forgiven you've been by God. And God says, I forgave you. Guess what? I want you to forgive other people. Ephesians 4.32 instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Jesus Christ, has forgiven you. He forgave us. And He says, I want you to forgive mercy. Luke chapter 6, verse 36 says, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. You're being merciful on me right now because I'm in overtime. Amen. Thank you. I'm almost done. Accountability. How many of you know we need each other? We're getting ready to start some spiritual life groups around here. Next year is going to be really wrapped up and you being a part of a spiritual life group. Some of you are sitting here and you're resistant to that. And you're like, mm -hmm. I tried that before and it didn't work for me. Well, it probably didn't work for you because you didn't work it. Or you understand what I'm saying? You see, you need people in your life. How many of you understand this? I need people to speak into my life and people need me to speak into their life. You came here today so somebody would speak into your life. We all need this. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, a friend sharpens a friend. You see, we need people to speak in our lives, people to hold us accountable to the commitments that we make in our life. I'm going to love God. Well then, how are you doing that? I'm going to love people. Okay, great. How are you doing that? We need this in our life. It's part of what God put us here for. The ministry. And I can't think of one of the greatest ministries outside of prayer. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 Paul said, I urge you, first of all, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. When I pray for you and you pray for me and we pray for each other, it changes everything. As we bring this service to a close, I, I want to say to you that this is a very high call to love like Jesus. And how many of you understand that we can't do this if God doesn't help? No but it starts with you and I experiencing the love of God. It starts with us loving God back. Then out of that, we'll start loving other people. And I know this is a heavy load. This is a lot. We're going to take three whole months next year and teach on this. And this is a lot for one service. But I believe that God is priming the pump in our lives. I believe He's getting us ready for the adventure of our life. He wants to love this world through me. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes across the room. Put some music on. I just want to say, if we were already doing this, guys, Palm Beach County would already be reached with the gospel of Jesus. But we're not. We've got a lot to work on. If we were already loving like Jesus, then this church would be the warmest place emotionally and spiritually that you've ever been in your life. And it would be a place where you would experience the love of God flowing out of people's lives, but it needs to get warmer. It needs to get needs to get a lot better a lot deeper than it is. And I believe the Lord brought us here today to start a work in our lives, to do something deep inside of us. So I'm going to ask you this morning to, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to ask you first of all to, to just begin to pray to the Lord. Say, God, I want to experience the love of God deep in my life. I need to experience the love of Jesus deep in my life. Would you just tell him that right now? Just say, Lord, I need you to, to just pour your love out in my life. I need your love. Would you tell him that right now? Just say, Lord, I need your love in my life more than I've ever had before. And let the Lord just begin to pour that out in your life right now. And as God is pouring that out in your heart, I want you to respond to that love. I want you to respond to God's love. I want you to say, Lord, I'm going to love you with all of my heart, with all of my mind. With all of my strength. Lord, with, with, with all of my soul. I'm going to love you. I'm responding, Jesus, to the love that you're pouring out in my life. I'm going to love you back. Lord. Just have that moment with God right now where, where you're, you're making a commitment to, to, to embrace and open up to the love of God. It'll change your life. It's the only thing that'll change your life. So, Lord, change me with your love. Change me with your love, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And as you're experiencing that love and as you're loving God back, then I want you to move from there and say, Lord, I want you to start loving other people through me. I want you to love my spouse 
more through me than it's happening right now. I want to be a loving person, Lord. I want to love my spouse. I want to love my husband. I want to love my wife. I want to love my kids. I want to love my grandkids. Lord, I want my friends, my neighbors, my co-workers, my schoolmates. I want anybody who comes in contact with me, Jesus, to experience your love through me. Just tell it right now. Just say, God, use me. I pray. Make me a loving person, Lord. Let me share the love of Jesus with other people. Let me, let me love them more like you've loved me. Let me love like Jesus. Would you make that your prayer? Lord, let me love like Jesus. Sacrificially, laying down thy life, let me love like Jesus. Father, in the strong name of Jesus Christ, I thank you that you're calling us, Lord, to a place of love. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you, God. Lord, for shedding your love in our lives, strong and true. And thank you, Father God, for calling us, Lord, to the task of loving, loving other people. Father, I pray that we would love like Jesus loves. That we would love each other like Jesus loves us. That we would love those.